Our first speaker is Bill Oliva from the Chief of Structures and Development, Wisconsin DOT. He's going to be speaking about strengthening of local bridges in Wisconsin to remove load postings. Uh, good afternoon, and um, it's a pleasure to be here. So uh, thanks for having me, having me in the uh, program for this. So uh, what I want to talk about today is a pilot project that Wisconsin DOT undertook to uh, literally strengthen uh, local locally owned bridges to remove load postings. We'll talk about uh, load postings on the local system and what uh, was driving that in Wisconsin, um, our strengthening program, and then posting removals uh, that uh, we're, we're undertaking. I think we all have posted bridges in our states. So for us, what really brought this home was SHV uh, requirements that we, we all are working through or have worked through uh, to analyze a new fleet of vehicles for our bridges, both state and local. For our on system, not too big of an issue. In Wisconsin, I think we only have about 18 load posted state owned bridges, which is pretty good. On the uh, local system, um, hundreds of them, literally. As we went through the SHV effort, you know, what, what was the outcome? You know, there were some new postings, some lowered postings because of that. Prior to the SHV effort, we had about 750 locally posted bridges. Um, after the uh, SHV effort, uh, that rose up to over 800. But during that process of analyzing, you know, we, you know, took a good look at the files, the um, analysis files for these bridges and inspection reports and other things and updated them. So we were able to remove a number of the postings uh, just through updates to the files and, and more contemporary analysis. And that reduced it somewhat, but you know, there's still a lot of uh, uh, bridges out there that were posted. And then we have our ongoing effort to, to reduce those um, you know, through our strengthening program, reevaluation of uh, the files that are out there and the ongoing replacement program for uh, local bridges where we're replacing uh, in excess of 100 bridges on the local system a year. The strengthening program overview. So, okay, so this SHV effort really put the spotlight on, on posting of bridges for the local system. As we looked at it, we, we recognized that, you know, this disparity between state system and local system was an issue. And, you know, we do have uh, in Wisconsin uh, a, a bridge replacement program for local bridges. It's based off a of sufficiency rating. And pretty much, um, unless you're below 50, uh, you're not going to qualify for the funds in Wisconsin. You know, if you're below 80, there's the possibility for rehabilitation, but there aren't a huge number of local bridges that go through our program for re rehabilitation, though they do. More people became aware of this issue. Industries had concerns, whether they were timber industries or other agricultural people hauling and things of that nature. It was apparent that there were growing awareness and concern for these postings. We decided to look at this, and you know, the problem for us were we had this population of good condition bridges that were still posted. Sufficiency ratings between 50 and 100, and postings uh, you know, below 40 tons. Uh, we do have postings above that because of some of the specific Wisconsin legal loads that are allowed to run the road. So we do, in fact, post above uh, legal load in Wisconsin. Uh, because we have Wisconsin specific legal. But the sweet spot for us of concern was these good condition bridges uh, with postings between 15 and 35 tons, about 30% of that posted inventory out there. So that's what we were uh, looking to do. So the strengthening program, the overall concept was, you know, because of the SHV's uh, impact, the fact that we did have to go out there and post some new bridges and lower postings on others for safety issues. Uh, we realized that re represented a significant issue for commerce and freight and things like that in specific places. I mean, some of these bridges are in the middle of nowhere and not too big of an issue. But you have quarries, agricultural operations, and other things that uh, are inhibited by those uh, postings. So we got some uh, support from our administrators and our secretary to take a look and, and do something about this. So we c created this strengthening program for local posted bridges in Wisconsin. Concept. And, and it is kind of, if you are from a DOT and you've developed bridge plans and lettings and all that, you hopefully you'll appreciate some of the, the streamlining that we're, we're going to show you here. But the concept was really to have our Bureau of Structure Engineers do all of the engineering associated with some of these um, uh, strengthening efforts, including outreach, structural design and detailing, uh, construction support, all that stuff from typically structural engineers who design bridges day in and day out or rate them. 
So that's a little stretch right there. The other concept was um, using local crews to perform the repairs. We wanted uh, as much as possible, especially with the county bridges, but we were asking the counties to also assist uh, townships to actually perform the work operations themselves as much as possible. And we wanted to identify as many common solutions for multiple bridges. So if, if we found a neat technology and there was a population of bridges that that technology fit, we wanted to deploy it as much as, as we could with uh, lessons learned and efficiency. You know, to do something like this, to pay locals to fix their bridges, you know, we modified one of the uh, contracting mechanisms that we have out there called a local force account, which is an agreement with uh, a, a local entity owner, typically a county highway. Again, it reflected that the county crews were doing the work, so we're paying them their you know, wages and overhead for that and materials. Counties would be reimbursed in this pilot project 100% of their cost for material and labors. It was not envisioned to do this perpetually, but this was an experiment that we wanted to have move forward. And we wanted to incentivize the locals to, to get involved and to stretch themselves. Not only were we stretching, we were asking them to stretch. Uh, limited scope of work. So we're out there to remove postings. We're not out there to fix curves. We're not out there to uh, fix railings and, and things of that nature. Staying off the approach helped us streamline the coordination. You know, suddenly utility coordination, some of the environmental, archaeological coordination, things of that nature were minimized or eliminated completely. And to do that, we had to work with our Bureau of Environment and directly with our Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources to get them buy into this uh, whole concept. So the removal process, so what bridges? You know, we showed you those numbers earlier. You know, we had in excess of 500 bridges out there that were posted that we wanted to take a bite out of. So we wanted high value bridges, uh, ones that were important freight and commerce, as much as we could identify those locations and corridors. We wanted a significant life remaining in those structures. So we didn't want to strengthen, invest and strengthen a bridge that was destined to be replaced in a couple of years for other reasons, uh, condition related. And we realized that not every uh, repair option was feasible for each bridge. So the criteria we used is in that bottom left corner there, it shouldn't be in the program for replacement, uh, that we've already uh, got a project up and running. The posting should be less than 40 tons. We, we didn't want to uh, strengthen the bridges that were posted above federal legal loads. Uh, we wanted the NBI conditions above five for the uh, supers uh, and sub. Hopefully with high ADTs or long detour routes that uh, uh, had a value. So the, those were the criteria that we we're using to sift through and figure out what our priorities were in the project. And then you could kind of see the population also. We had an awful lot of timber bridges out there that were good candidates that met this criteria. Steel beam bridges and concrete slabs and then a whole host of other kind of uh, unique structures types that, that went along with that. So timber, concrete, and steel were the, the, the big focus for us. So in our pilot project, we had 16 bridges that we moved forward with for actual construction in the field. We had 14 additional ones that we used advanced analysis techniques, uh, finite element, 3D, and all that to help uh, remove it. But it required additional engineering effort above the norm. So uh, we'll, we'll include that 14 also in the numbers. So for the timber, you know, part of the issue with ours in Wisconsin, we have a lot of these timber laminated deck, slab deck bridges. You know, um, whether it is the transverse post tensioning that is loosened up over time, or just the, the distribution factor in general was a problem. We went after a good number of these, and uh, the technique that we used uh, on many of these was the application of a spreader deck. Uh, you know, certainly we would tighten post-tensioning rods um, if uh, that was applicable, but the real thing was the uh, uh, spreader deck that helped on most of these. And you know, what that really got you was um, a w wider distribution area for that load, which really pushed a, a number of these over the top. So here we have county crews out there, and in Wisconsin, uh, the timber supplier that worked on a number of these supplying materials to the county was Wheeler, and they were pretty good to work with. You know, we developed plans. Uh, with our engineers and they would give us shop drawings and we'd uh, work things out with them. But in the end it was the county forces. Wheeler would deliver the product out there and the county forces would install. With the spreader deck, they uh, bolt these down uh, into the existing deck. They remove the asphalt surface and, and clean the, the bridge deck. Then they uh, bolt these in and you can see them going down. They will also grout underneath them you can see the, the result there, uh, the grouting, and then pave over the top of it. So it was a pretty uh, straightforward operation for the counties. 
you know, they didn't require a lot of special equipment on their part, maybe the uh, grouting equipment. We, we did a good number of these. They all pulled on really successfully, definitely within the county's capabilities, and a good technique if you've got these timber bridges, you know, again, the, uh, the laminated transverse uh, slab to strengthen them and increase the distribution of uh, the live load on them. Uh, here's one, uh, also a timber bridge. We also did some full superstructure replacement with timber, and this is our Richland County, Wisconsin where they removed a steel girder concrete slab and replaced it with a uh, lighter timber superstructure that uh, had more capacity. So again, the county crews uh, doing the work, the supplier delivering the materials to the job site, and, um, and then it goes. And I, I hope you noticed the cows underneath there. Uh, we, we had some concerns for the safety of the cows. But what, what's also kind of important in here is the, their ability to stay uh, on minimal approach uh, roadway to do this work, so they didn't have to rip up a lot of pavement. But also, uh, if you were watching, there was virtually no disruption to the stream below. So a lot of these commitments that we made to our Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources as far as, you know, will have minimal impact, and therefore don't force me to send my structural engineers through an environmental process or detailed, it, it played out well, so it was kind of a win-win. So for sure, this went right to our DNR and you know, to ease their concerns that, in fact, we can do these actions without the risk of adverse environmental uh, impacts, and therefore, you should cut us some slack on environmental documentation. Also, with regard to timber, uh, there were some other efforts we did similar to the advanced analysis. Uh, there was a wet service factor uh, that's used in uh, calculating allowable stresses in timber. Within the code, one of our engineers, Alex Pence uh, of Wisconsin DOT, identified an area where there was a conflict in code provisions uh, that uh, he worked out, took the lead working with Federal Highways, AASHTO, uh, various AASHTO committees uh, on bridges and structures, and also Fortis Product Laboratory to get okay to use a higher value in there, uh, which uh, helped us out uh, in removing some of those timber postings as well. Some of the other technologies we use included uh, steel uh, retrofits to existing steel girders. So just bolting on more section, increasing the section modulus overall, worked out pretty easy. Again, you know, I'll pause on this one just to show you, you know, we gave the county the details. We came to agreement on a cost, and we set them loose, you know, to do the work. We really had no construction oversight out there. We went back to verify the work was done, but their means and methods were completely up to them. So what you're looking at here is, is their own creation of a working platform to uh, stay out of the water, where they supported off the existing beams, you know, a platform to work. I made sure our DNR got a look at this, because we want to move forward with this, and we want to assure them that we can do these actions without um, adverse environmental impact. Aside from that, the county workers got out there. Um, you know, we would show up once in a while to answer questions, take some pictures, and see how things were going. But uh, they they took matters into their hands, applied the the strengthening there. You know, drilling and, and bolting. They would order the materials and install them, um, and they did a great job. Uh, we've also uh, worked on a number of concrete uh, slab retrofits out there using primarily FRP, but some other technologies that I'll show you in a second. Um, and that's worked out really well. We've done both bottom of slab and top of slab reinforcement. Typically top of slab are carbon fiber bars. Uh, bottom of slab will be the uh, carbon fiber fabrics uh, installed. As you can see right here, this is an example of the, the bottom slab, obviously. What was also pretty neat was in working through uh, the process of shop drawings and, and working with suppliers is that they uh, were more than willing to come out and train the county engineers on how to apply FRP. Again, I would guess most of our counties have never done that type of work before and, and they were, I, I think industry recognized the potential for this as far as a market and also the benefit uh, and, and common goal that we had as far as removing load postings and, and getting the local units doing more work. So, uh, you know, a big thank you to industry uh, for stepping up to the plate and uh, supporting this program, both with materials and training. Concrete slab retrofits. Not only did we use FRP, uh, but we use, also used um, metal reinforcement. And, and in this case, you know, we had a uh, multiple span uh, concrete slab that was designed with H15 loading. The uh, cutoffs were really too short for the contemporary um, HL93 and other uh, loadings. 
that was creating a, a, a need for posting on this bridge. So this was up in Chippewa County, Wisconsin. And again, you can see a two-span haunch concrete slab. And we got a little video that shows the process of them doing the work. And, and again, um, as we went through this process working with the counties, um, we were continuously impressed with the capabilities of the local forces. Not each of the 72 Wisconsin counties can do this type of work. Clearly a number can and an increasing number of them can and are interested in doing this. So all of these people, you, you know, you're seeing our county crews out there. I think they may have subcontracted a mill to take off the top uh, course of this. The concept here again is to put down some steel reinforcing plates and engage them to extend the uh, negative moment steel. And we see it have some quick bond, I think, there, materials being uh, mixed up to uh, create leveling plat pads to place these uh, reinforcement plates down. Again, the counties were very comfortable working with these materials, um, and you can see them applying them, and that's the reinforcing plate you can see about to be put down on that leveling pad. So they would drill it in and use mechanical anchors to, to put it down. They preloaded the, the structure before they actually anchored down that plate. So when the structure left, that plate was engaged. But to check it, we've got Alex Pence on the right and Andrew Smith of our office actually installing strain gauges to uh, uh, measure and see that that plate actually engages and, and is doing what it was meant to do and designed to do. So, so that's what's going on here. And it's kind of neat to have those capabilities in your office. Uh, you know, we luckily had Andrew Smith who had some experience with uh, this type of strain monitoring. Uh, and he was also involved with this program. And he's, you know, checking to see the reaction. So that went in really well. It engaged. It did its job actually better than we anticipated. And then uh, Chippewa County came back and they put a uh, concrete overlay over the top of the whole thing using a Viber screen. Again, county's capabilities to do this type of work is, um, is really beneficial to themselves, but you know, potentially we could see use uh, maybe even on the state system in some circumstances. Other tools that we used, we alluded to refined analysis. So uh, you know, we did um, 16 of these bridges with uh, actual construction techniques in the field, but 14 also with some uh, pretty detailed refined analysis to um, analyze and justify removal of the load post posting through better understanding what the true capability and load paths were in, in a number of the different structures. This type of effort requires obviously a lot more effort than the standard uh, uh, line girder type analysis or even grillage type analysis. But uh, again, you know, the amount of effort compared to maybe just going out and strengthening it without co uh, construction techniques is, is a lot less overall cost. So um, overall, very successful so far. We removed a whole bunch. Um, what you can see on the right is what are currently calculated for posting needs on the local roads, as far as less than 20, between 20 and 35, and 40 or higher. And what's pretty clear is um, even though we work with these local units of government and, and tell them in some instances, hey, you don't really need that posting. You know, we've whether your inspector or yourself have, have done the analysis or we've done the analysis to help you, you've got greater capacity and no need for that posting, a number of the uh, bridge owners will want to maintain that posting because they believe it's in their interest to preserve the structure, to keep heavier loads off and maybe keep the deck in good condition longer, things of that nature. So we continue to work with these units, but in the end, they're, they're bridges. They have the legal authority to post these bridges pretty much uh, where they want them as long as it is above their actual capacity. So if it's below their capacity, we may take issues and work with them to get them posted correctly. Um, overall, the benefits of this uh, project um, to the counties were a uh, cost-effective method to help maintain bridges. You know, So this was on our dime, but in the future, as they contend with maintaining their infrastructure themselves, they've got a few more tools to do it with and a few more experiences to use as they go forward. New challenging work for the county crews. 
I believe each and every last one of them, except a few of them who are putting the uh, GUI FRP up on the bottom of the bridge decks, really, uh, I, th I think, enjoy this uh, effort and uh, their involvement. A big learning opportunity to all of us, the counties uh, and the state, as far as what we can do working together. Some new methods and technologies uh, that can be applied uh, to other projects um, not in the program. Um, the ability to, uh, for these counties to help the townships out. So a lot of the bridges that we did in this program weren't county-owned. They were owned by, by the townships within the county. So we contracted with the county to fix the township's bridges. So kind of an interesting relationship, but I would imagine that for it would uh, strengthen the, the relationship between the county and the townships. More options and uh, choices for future, whether it's repair or dealing with it. Okay, moving forward. We got a whole bunch more out there. The ones on the right and blue are, are scheduled for replacement. They're in the program. Everything to the left is a possibility. Phase one is above. You know, the real issue there is most of these are owned by townships and cities and villages. So the outreach to them is going to take a lot more effort as we go forward. I want to give Alex Pence of uh, Wisconsin DOT Bureau of Structures a lot of credit. So again, we took a structural engineer. And we asked him to develop a complete project through concept and final construction, you know, m creating a map. Uh, the whole way through, and Alex did a fabulous job. Andrew Smith also uh, supporting this effort. Uh, with that, uh, any questions? No, the, the question is, did we load test any of these after the fact? And aside from that Chippewa County where we checked that those uh, reinforcements were engaged, pretty much the only one, but based on the techniques, our analysis supports the removal. I had a quick question about when you asphalt overlaid the, the timber again, did you use like a polymer infused that asphalt to try and keep the water from going through it or is it just regular asphalt mix? I don't know the answer. I would suspect it was a, probably a standard asphalt mix that the counties typically would use. Sometimes our locals don't maintain their bridges to the same degree that we do. Are there any of those strengthening approaches that you would have reservations on if they're not keeping tabs on it as much? No, actually m most of these were, were Pretty robust techniques. You know, FRP, once it's in place, you pretty much can forget about it. Obviously, you'll inspect it on a regular basis. Most of the other techniques were pretty much put them in and bury them, whether it's with the overlays or, 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 or whatever. So, so overall, they're, once they're installed, we're pretty confident uh, that they, they should perform you know, for a significant amount of time uh, without needing close monitoring. Is uh, load, uh, field load testing, was that is it eligible to be involved in the program if they want to take the money and do field load testing? Supposedly, it's good condition bridge. Obviously, you only need remove the posting. That would be probably cheaper. Would that is that eligible in, in your pro instead of uh, field field load? Yeah, we actually um, have a research project that's just starting out in Wisconsin Highway Research with timber bridges that's looking at answering just that to develop a, a specification that the counties can use to proof roll their timber bridges, you know, have a professional engineer use that specification to go through the process and whether it's by deflection or some other easy measurement, if that's capable. No, we haven't done it, but we have the intention to develop that process. Thank you. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.